We're going to be dealing with the truth about Palm Sunday, but I have to set the stage. So first thing I want to tell you is the Jewish people, wonderful people, they had to have a new calendar. So one of the things I'm going to share with you before we get into this is God gave the Jewish nation two calendars. Everyone say two. Okay, they have a civil calendar where it starts at September, like ours does. And they have a religious or a ceremonial calendar, which starts in April. Whoa, how'd that happen? Quickly, I'm going to tell you that when the Israelites for 400 years were captive in Egypt and ready to be delivered, God says, okay, Moses, we're going to read you to that part. We're going to have fun with it. Because I love to teach you knowledge about the scripture. It's so interesting. Removing the religious part. And putting the God part in there. Where religion, man's ideas can go away. So anyway, he changed the calendar. He says, now this is going to be the first day of year. You're going to start afresh and new out of Egypt. It's a type and shadow of what you and I did when we accepted Jesus Christ. God got us out of Egypt. And put us in his kingdom. Aren't you glad? Now how long did it take for them to leave Egypt? A night. They all finally got through everything. Grabbed it all out. They ate the, the dinner, the whole works. And shot out at night, right? How long did it take for you to get saved? Didn't take but a moment. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Boom. They were out of Egypt. Amen. Now, let me ask you, if it was only an 11-day journey from Egypt to the promised land, why did it take them 40 years? Let me just say it in a nice, polite way. We get out of the world when we accept Jesus Christ, but it takes a while for the world to get out of us. Do you understand what I mean? Some of your old ways of thinking to keep on throwing you in bondage. You know, come on, we're talking about ourselves. And so it took an 11-day journey. It took them 40 years, and the first generation didn't even go into the promised land because of their disobedience and their foul-mouthedness. woo -hoo! And God left it in the Bible for us to read to protect ourselves from not falling after the same bad example. Some would say amen. amen. So let me just share the calendar a little bit more with you. The month of Ab, or what we call Nisan or April became the first of their calendar. Okay, make a note of that. Okay, and then Tisha or Tishrei is the September. Okay, say I got that. Now I'm going back to God and his word for just a minute before we get into this. And that is how many know that there are mind-blowing truths within the word of God? And within these mind-blowing truths, it, it depicts the scripture. Now, there's a lot of people going around saying, oh, the Bible's got a lot of flaws in it. But did you know there's a reward been there since 1918 of $25,000 in, 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 in the Capitol in Washington, D.C., in the Library of Congress to anyone? That check will go to anyone that can found, find a contradiction in the Bible, and no one's ever found it. But you hear about, all, oh, yeah, there's, you know, man's, you know, no. well, I'm going to show you something going to blow your mind. God was so intricately, so mathematically perfect, so precise in writing the scripture and having it translated and canalized in those 66 books. God left the trail of his son throughout every chapter. He went and literally just left all these clues that he has come to rescue us. Don't let the God of this world, which is the devil, blind your minds to the truth. If you don't believe me, that there's somebody out there telling you lies, just turn on the news. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> Satan is the God of this world, and in this hour, he's working very hard to keep people from Jesus. Because when people meet Jesus, they lose the religion, they lose all those bad thoughts, and they realize that's the best friend that they could ever have. 
He doesn't condemn them. He walks through them. He gives them wisdom. He gives them knowledge. Now listen to this wisdom. God intricately, when he laid out the scripture, and you've got to realize that there was over 40 different authors, over 2,000 years apiece, some never knowing one another. Not a mistake. And God left little clues in it. Let me give you one. Can I give you one? This will fit what we're going to do today when we get into scripture. The Bible and its 66 books. In Genesis chapter 5, how many here remember what Genesis chapter 5 talks about? Well, it doesn't talk about much of anything, but gives you a list of 10 names. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the creation. Genesis chapter 2, how God appropriated. Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall. But in Genesis chapter 4, we see the murder of Cain and Abel. But in Genesis chapter 5, all we do is have a list of 10 names. Here's how intricate God is. Now, if you like kind of stuff like this, then, man, come to Bible study. But listen to this. In Genesis chapter 5, we have a list of 10 names. They are Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan. Okay, this one here is hard to pronounce. It's Mahalalel. Okay, I'll explain. And then it's Jared. My son's middle name is Jared. There's Enoch. Methuselah. How many here are Methuselah? Yeah. And then Lamech. And then Noah. Now, in those names, how many here know that some people get a name and the parents really put that name because it has some form of meaning for them? But sometimes people get named and they just, the parents say, hey, that's a nice name. They just throw it out. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. My parents thought I was going to be a girl back in the day, born in 54, you know. And they thought I was going to be a girl, so they named me Carrie. <laughs> well, I was a boy. And you say, well, what's Carrie? Carrie, now listen to this. God gave my mom a dream, said to name the child Carrie. They are thinking I'm going to be a girl. God knows I'm going to be a boy. And Carrie means bringer of good news and light encouragement. Now, that does not describe me. If not, pray for me. <laughs> well, the Jewish people were anatomically doing that. When they named their child, sometimes they'd wait weeks until they watched the child, and then they would give it a name. Like, for example, the name Joshua means Savior. It's the Hebrew word for Jesus, Savior. You see? So there's a lot of things in there. So I'm going to pop this out at you because it's really going to work well with our sermon today. Now listen. In Genesis chapter 5, first man is named Adam. His name means mankind. Two. The second is Seth. Means appointed. Remember what uh, uh, Eve said? God has appointed to me another man, another seed. Okay? Enosh, okay, is mortal or frail. Now, this is going to be a message when I'm done with it. This is how intricate God is. So don't make fun of God. Don't play games with God. Don't poo-poo God. Open your heart and say, God, you've got to deal with me because I am a mess. Talk to God that way instead of trying to impress him. Oh, the other thing is, well, if I come to God and go to church, I'm going to have to give up my friends and give up all. Who's telling you that lie? God's not saying that. You've been deceived into, and it's kept you from coming to God all these years. I was. I was deceived. I led my mom and dad to the Lord. They were deceived too. The whole planet's full of deception. Which deception will you choose? Or will you turn to Christ? Who's full of grace and truth. So third name is Enosh, which means mortal and frail. Fourth name is Canaan. K-E-N-A-N. Means sorrow. How would you like to have the name sorrow? Go to church, you know, go to school. Hey, sorrow, come on over here. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Then the funny name that was really hard to spell. I guess the parents... When they named him Sorrow, thought, hey, we're going to, enough of this. Then the ne next child is Mahanalel, which means blessed of God. Say with me, blessed of God. Blessed. Then Jared means descending from above. Then Enoch, a teacher. Teaching means teaching. Okay. Methuselah, listen to this one. 
His death shall bring judgment. That's what his name means. That's what his name means. Lamech, despairing. I'm going to show you. We're going to get into this. Come on. You like to learn, don't you? You like to get into the word? Ooh, this is really good. Lamech means to despairing, and then Noah means comfort and rest. So it would read like this, those ten names. Mankind was appointed mortal and frail and sorrowing. The blessed God came down teaching about his, and dying, and he shall bring, by teaching and dying, the discouraging rest and comfort. Now, if you would like a copy of that, I'm going to have this later on after the service, okay? The ten names of God in there tells us the gospel message that Jesus Christ came to rescue the despairing and give us comfort and rest. Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you what? All right, let's get into this. Amen. Palm Sunday. Amen. So let's set you up. Would you take your Bible and go with me? To Hebrews chapter 10, please. All right, good morning. And I just want to basically say this, that we're going to see that God is going to use Christ to fulfill every inter intricate detail of the Passover lamb. Okay? So everything that Jesus did and say, said, he heard it from his father, which means that he fulfilled all prophetic words concerning him. How many know he came out of Bethlehem? Right? Prophetic word. It would be the seed of the woman that would crush the devil's head. A prophetic word. Genesis 3.15. Right? And so the government will be on his shoulders and he will be the king and all these things are prophetically declared. Now when Jesus is walking this out in the New Testament... He's walking out Palm Sunday. He's fulfilling what you know to be Exodus chapter 12, starting at verse 2. Now, you're going with me to Hebrews 10. And it's going to tell us about Jesus here. Listen to what it says. Therefore, when Jesus came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But a body you have prepared for me. Let me ask you something. Can God die? No. So here we see God having to come as a man taking on a body for the purpose of taking it with our sin and sicknesses and dying. Now God has never had a human body. Now, when Jesus came, he had to wait nine months, be born out like a regular child. He had to be raised up by his parents. And whether you know it or not, that when you follow Jesus, you're going to notice that Joseph suddenly is not there anymore. Joseph was sick and he died early. And so Jesus was raised in this incubation of the Spirit of God, getting ready for his entering into the ministry and the, all scripture be fulfilled. Remember at the baptism of Jesus, where John was baptizing, Jesus says, John says, look, I'm not worthy to even touch your shoes. And, and John says, look. And Jesus says, look, I must fulfill all righteousness. Right? Right? Well, on the cross, one of the things he said was, it is finished. Hello? So the work of your redemption and your rescue is completely finished. The next part is whether or not you will accept God's salvation or not. If you do, God says, I will work with you as long as you want to work with me. Now, somebody said to me, well, Carrie, why are you afraid to get saved? This is years and years and years ago. He says, I'm not afraid to get saved. I just don't want to lose any of my friends. That's what I told him. I says, don't you know when the real friends that you have go away when your money dries up, when your pot dries up, and when your alcohol is gone, they'll be gone. Are they real friends? So when I really, really did get saved... My real friends stayed and they were rejoicing with me 
although they didn't like the decision. I was in a very good rock and roll band. We were going on tour with Wailing Jennings and Willie Nelson as a backup band. And right in the middle of all that, Jesus came into my life. Thank you, Lord. And my band about killed me because that was it for our career. How dare you, Gary, get saved? You see, when I got saved, I didn't give up anything. It all gave me up. It all gave me up. It was like the devil says, ah, I can't touch him anymore. Then he'll work back into your life if you're not careful. Let's go on now. You with me? Hebrews 10. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering, you had no desire. But a body, you had given me a physical body. You have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices in the Old Testament were for sin. Had no, God had no pleasure in them. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book which is written of me to do your will, O God. Didn't Jesus come to do the will of God? Previously saying, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings, offerings for sin. The Lord did not have any desire nor had pleasure in them. Why didn't God have pleasure in animal sacrifices for our sin? Because it couldn't fully remove it. Another thing is, people say, well, why did God require blood sacrifice to cover our sins? Can anybody tell me? I'll tell you. Blood shields. If, how many's ever smelled blood? It has a unique smell. You can smell it for miles. It has a unique godly shielding ability that shields God from our putridness of our flesh. You need to listen. Whether you like it or not, or whether you think this is the truth or not, you better pay attention. We are putrid in the eyes of God, yet he sent his son to get us back. He's the only one that can take the putrefication away from us. By when we accept him and walk with him, his blood is constantly applied. But going back to that, when God saw that they had sinned, he, he sacrificed the first animal and covered them in skins. Why? Because the sin of their body was emanating out. Now you need to, let me describe this for you. The sin of their body was so foul. And folks, I'm looking at you. And you'll say, well, why? Because Satan entered them. When Adam committed high treason by eating of the tree of the good and evil, Satan's nature entered into God's child. And it starts emanating from it. It's called the flesh. It's called the body of sin. And God still didn't give up on us. So what did he do? He covered them so he could fellowship with them. He's now lost his children. Some other foreign ungodly thing is now dictating to his kids. This is a huge rescue program, folks. Are you going to help? Are you going to be part of the part we need to rescue? <laughs> You're with me. So Jesus, everything he did was to rescue mankind. And Palm Sunday is no different. Are you with me? So he goes on, previously sacrificed, burnt offerings. Behold, I come in the volume of the book, which is written of me, to do your will, O God. He takes away the Old Testament and establishes the new. He says he takes away the old, establishes the new. Now this is where Christians don't understand. How many here know all scripture is given by inspiration of God? Old Testament, New Testament, right? But here's the key. In the Old Testament, if you read Old Testament, they're looking towards the receiving of Messiah. He hadn't come yet. Right up through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and up until the death and resurrection... That was all Old Testament. That's why Jesus says, you have heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And they say, yeah. But I say unto you, New Testament. He that's angry with his brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. 
So here it is. There's two of you sitting there. There's the old you and there's the new you. The old you doesn't want to open your mouth and sing or be happy because you feel condemnation and self-justification while your spirit wants to get going. Who's in charge? Your old man or your new man? Are you looking unto the Messiah or have you willing to accept the Messiah and learn in the New Testament how to walk with him? Folks, how many has ever had somebody maybe in school that was tough and big? Maybe like Scott. Scott's the kind of guy I'd make friends with Scott's <laughs> in high school because I was a little scrawny guy. I have a lot of Scots hanging around. Somebody got a line, I stick Scott on him. <laughs> Come on, don't look at me in that tone of voice. I use just God. My pleasure, I'm sorry. I love you. Get the tape. You don't know what. Anyway, so the idea is we're, we have Jesus in us. Listen, who's going to really bother you when you're walking with Jesus? Now, listen. Your mind immediately goes, oh, yeah, you did. No, you weren't walking with Jesus when you got into that trouble. You weren't walking with Jesus when you got kicked, when that person made up that lie about you weren't walking with Jesus. But well, how do I walk with Jesus? You get up in the morning, you meet with him, and you walk with him. You didn't do that. You just headed out in your day on your own, and the devil's going, hmm, let's see what we can do. With so and so today, they didn't pray, they didn't ask God for help. Let's let's just, just run them through the rag. Hello, how many days you ever experienced when you should have just prayed? Everyone say, "Thank God for wisdom." Amen. So let's get into this. All right. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Would you go with me? Mark chapter eleven. We're going to look at Palm Sunday for a minute. Mark eleven. We're going to look at verses one through eleven. Now, everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus fulfilled was all prophesied. Hello? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. Wasn't it true that Jesus didn't say anything when Pontius Pilate was doing all his thing and the Sanhedrin was doing all their thing, Caiaphas and, and all of that were doing their thing? He opened not his mouth. He didn't defend himself. And then when finally somebody said, Pilate says, are you the son of God? He says, you say, you say, Jesus was never to draw attention to himself. He was to draw attention to his father and that he was the perfect example of what the father looked like because he said to Philip, he that has seen me has seen the father. That's why Jesus needs to be the focal point of our life so we can get a description of what God's all about. Because if you read about God in the Old Testament, you think God's harsh and mean and he's, he's sucking up people and all kinds of crazy stuff that's going on. You're going, but you come over in the New Testament, Jesus is loving people, hugging kids and everything. You're going, is that the same God? Yes, it's the same God. But in the Old Testament, nobody had Jesus in them. They all were subject to do evil. So when a bunch of people who said they loved God did a whole bunch of evil, the ground opened up and swallowed them. Everybody smile up at me and say, I'm in the New Testament. <sighs> and the reason why that happened is God had to move heaven and earth to see that Jesus would be born in the earth. And if anything, including the devil himself, could keep Jesus from being born, you and I would all have no hope. We'd all be eternally lost. So therefore, if anybody came against God's plan, they were treated as an evil one because they're stopping everybody from experience the rescue plan through Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Now, folks, here's a quick story. How many's ever heard and seen that little poster where you see the little cat? He's holding on. So how you doing? I says I'm hanging in there, right? Dummy. 
I'm not calling you a dummy. I'm calling the cat a dummy. True story. Uh, a dirigible was out of control and a whole bunch of people were trying to hold it down. And they were dropping like flies to their death. And this one guy stood up there for two hours. And they couldn't quite see what he was doing. The wind subsided and they got the thing back down. He was still on the rope. The reporters of Bless Their Darling Harbor and ran up there. So everybody else fell to their death. What's your secret? <laughs> they didn't quite say it like that, but... And he says, well, I watched. Everybody was just holding on for their dear life. And I said, hmm, there's something wrong with that. So I took the rope and wrapped it around me and let it hold on to me. Are you holding on to Jesus? Doof. Wrap him around your life. Listen, he'll make you the sweetest person. You won't have a problem finding a mate. He'll make you the most honest person. You won't have a problem holding a job. Hello? He'll wipe out your bad credit so you can find a house. But you've got to walk with him, child. You can't just sit around and talk about him. The devils do that. You've got to walk with him. And he doesn't take away the fun. I've never had so much fun in my life. Following Jesus. Did I make mistakes? Yeah. Did I almost die? Many times. But I'm having the time of my life. It's better than boring myself to death. You want to know about adventure? Come to one of our training areas. We'll train you. We'll show you. Well, I can't keep all this stuff to myself. If I do, I'm going to get a big chew-out session when I get home with God. He's going, Carrie, why'd you keep all that stuff I showed, shared you with you to yourself? You say, well, I, nobody loves me. Nobody cares. Stick your big lip out and wait for a bird. No, all right, so let's go on. Now, I'm trying to keep it light-minded for a minute because we have to go into some serious situations. Okay, listen. So now as they drew near to Jerusalem and then to Bethany, to the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and then they said to them, go into the village opposite you and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which there is one has sat. No, excuse me, where no one has sat. That's good. Juice. And, and when no one has sat, I love this. And so he's got this virgin colt that's going to carry him in to Jerusalem. Did you know that in Zechariah 9.9, it declares that he will come riding in on a, a donkey colt? So everything that Jesus did was prophesied or declared or a type and shadow. So you'll say, well, isn't that great? So let's just follow him for a minute. So they found the donkey and, and they spoke to them in verse 6. As Jesus had commanded, and so they let him go. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it. And many spread their, their clothes on the road. And others cut down leafy branches from trees and palm leaves. And, and they threw them on the road. Then those went before those and followed and cried out saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Right? Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what were they doing? They were declaring that Jesus is the king. Now, these are his disciples. Now, how many know not everybody thought Jesus was the king? So we see everybody's rejoicing. And here's why they thought he was. They thought Jesus was going to come down and take over the world. Kick Rome out of its position, take the Caesar, remove him, and set him up as the king. Because they were Jewish people, and they always knew that their king will come one day, and he will rule and reign with a rod of iron. Right? But not this time. Jesus is coming as a lamb sacrifice for one reason only, to remove our sin and sicknesses. Say amen. 
Now, you see, he removed our sin and sicknesses, but you've got to pick up the blot remover and apply it to your life. The blot remover is Jesus. You have to pick up Jesus and say, Lord, I don't know. I'm not sure. My first prayer was, Jesus, I don't even know if you're real. But my dad did tell me not to, to speak evil about God. So, Lord, if you're real, show me. And that was it. God took me and he began to open my eyes and show me things and pop my eyes. And he says, now, do you believe? Right, right away I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But he showed me. So let me encourage you. If you've never asked God, Lord, show me that you love me. Show me that you want to work in my life. Let him show you. He's the only one who can. The other dude doesn't like you. The other dude is the one that hangs the carrot in front of your face and says, you get this new thing or you get a new thing here, your whole life's going to work out. No, only if you get Jesus in your heart and listen to him will your life work out for the better. He says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Say amen, somebody. And so they went through all of those wonderful, I might, might as well sit what's left. And you can see my sleeve got baptized. Yeah. All right. So let's go on with this. Jesus entered Palm Sunday. Notice the calendar. So everyone go to Exodus chapter 12 with me, will you? Exodus chapter 12. Remember the story? This is the story of the Passover. Exodus chapter 12. Jesus, the Passover lamb, but at this time, the Israelites were in bondage. Remember the 10 plagues? Okay, the last plague had come, and finally Pharaoh said, get out of here. We can't handle you anymore. The firstborn of all were killed. Folks, what you don't know about that plague, those 10 plagues, is every god that the Egypts worshipped became a plague. They worshiped the flies, so they got flies. They worshiped the frogs, they got the frogs. I mean, how would you like, you come over to my house and I got a big frog in my living room and I'm going, oh, froggy, 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 froggy. Uh, well, that's what they did. All these real intelligent people worshiping sticks and stones and all that because Satan, the god of this world, had blinded their mind and told them to do it. And periodically would show up and do some magic tricks. Remember Moses and Aaron and the rod that turned into a snake? See, they knew about the occult, the paranormal. But Jesus is Lord. Can you say amen? amen. And so it goes on. So let's, let's read. Now, in Exodus 12, starting in verse 2, this month shall be called the beginning of months. This is taking their first month and changing it to April or Nisan. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Verse 3, speak to the congregation of Israel saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. Okay? So April 10th, everyone say April 10th. In the beginning, a lamb was selected. Without blemish, without spot of the firstborn. Can you say amen? amen. Okay. Now, what day was that? Tenth. Guess what day at this time? Yeah, it's probably on the, on the deal. But today, back then, was the tenth. Jesus is entering now into Jerusalem. What are they going to do? They're examining him. See, in God's view, the people are are choosing whether they accept Jesus or whether they reject Jesus. The disciples loved him. Everything, he's being examined by people. Read Exodus. They're to take the lamb, select the lamb after examining it. Now let's go through and read it again. According to the house of his father, a lamb for every household. And yet the household is too small, then they would go ahead and agree with the other neighbors. And then it goes on further to say, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Sounds like Jesus to me. 
you can take it from the sheep or from the goats. You know the term sheep and goats? It's talking about people. You take it from the monks, the people, okay? All right. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of that month. Everybody say 14th. The 14th is when Jesus was taken. I'm just running through this with you, okay? Now, some of you wonderful people have gone through Lent and gone through some of these wonderful that teach us about Jesus in this time during the leading up of the crucifixion. That's wonderful. Here's just another one, okay? So every, Jesus is stepping through all the requirements of Exodus chapter 12. They selected him, not spot, not blemish, amen? And they shall take it of some of the blood and put it on the doorpost. So we know that they were to take the lamb. They were to prepare it. Say, I got it. Now Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. He does a few things. I'm going to just do this from memory. First thing that Jesus does on the cult is he comes right into the temple and he looks and says the money changers, people were buying and selling. They were supposed to do it out on the steps of the court of the temple, but they were inside the court with the brazen altar and a few other things. They have made the house of God a den of thieves. So that was the first thing he did. The second thing he did is he went up and he started being presented before his brother, and then he started teaching parables. Now, how many here don't know what a parable is? A parable is a story that proves a point. I shared a parable with you this morning. It's just a way in which to emphasize a point without confronting anybody. You know, right? Say amen. So he did about nine or ten parables, and then in the 26th or the 23rd chapter of Matthew, he starts rebuking the religious people. He calls them white and sepulchers. You're full of dead man's bones. You make great big prayers. You try to impress the world. You do things for the love of men and not for the love of God. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me, he said. And all this time, Jesus is going through all of that being expected and fulfilling every little teeny jot and tittle of Exodus chapter 12. They're examining him everything. How many here remember the story about the sacrifice? I'm just going to tell you. In the sacrifice, when a priest was called upon the Lord, ordained as a priest, in order for him to go in and represent the people, listen carefully, he would have to sacrifice a cow or a bull. And that sacrifice cleansed him and his family. Now, for some reason, if he didn't get cleansed of his sin and his family, he couldn't go into the holy place and sacrifice the lamb and use the scapegoat. Everyone say lamb and scapegoat. I'll, I'll make sense of this in a minute. So, he, this is how complicated the Old Testament was. You want to go to church? Find the neighbor's cat. Let's make a sacrifice, Sherry. <laughs> that ain't going to work. Can you say, you know how ridiculous it is. So he'd have to cleanse himself, then go in and hope that he doesn't die. And now he's to confess all the sins of the people for one year over this poor goat and send the goat outside into the wilderness with all the sins in it, on it. And then the, the lamb was to be cut, sacrificed, the blood would be drained, put on the altar, and the blood would be over the mercy seat. Now, both those things are a type of Christ. Didn't God lay on Jesus the sins and iniquities of us all? See, he became the scapegoat. God the Father laid all of our sins on him and put him out. That's why Jesus said on the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because at that time, he became sin. He became the scapegoat. All was left is the pure lamb now. And the lamb was to be sacrificed, and its entrails to be burned up, and the sins would be forgiven. Can you say amen? 
Wow, that's a heavy duty thing. So, you know, in Jerusalem, when it came time for the sacrifices and the feasts and all that, it was a huge celebration, a huge deal, because the sins of the whole nation were going to be cleansed that day. But think about it. Jesus is on his way to Bethany. He's headed to Passover, to Calvary, and to death, and to the resurrection. And it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father, making intercession and prayers for you and I. Can you say amen? So we're covered. Now here's what I want to tell you. There is some bad teaching out there, and I don't know who or what, but it teaches you that God saves you, but not all. So gives us that impression that we're walking with Jesus, and every once in a while the devil's going to come in and nail us with something. I got news for you. Do you believe that Jesus had given you the perfect sacrifice? He redeemed you completely. He's got an absolute perfect package. The only problem is us because we're weak in some areas. So what God wants us to do is not to condemn ourselves when we fail, but to go to God directly and say, Lord, I failed at that. You know that. Help strengthen me so I don't fail the next time. So I don't fail the next time. You see? And it's kind of like that little child learning to rock. Gets up, falls down. Gets up, falls down. Gets up this time, wobbles about, and then falls down again. It's not much different than that. We've all, some of you are parents. You know what that's like. So why do you think that if you are a child that is just barely getting your walk together, you're going to run around and run your life? No wonder you're having such problems. I asked why I had problems. Hey, how many of you remember the time when you became a teenager and your parents suddenly grew stupid? Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You all were there. Remember in that teenager year? God set you up to learn and grow. and We kind of take it to the flesh, you know. And suddenly I came in one day and I thought mom and dad had grown stupid. They ate some stupid stuff or something. No, I just got full of myself. Folks, let's be filled with God and not ourselves. Can you say amen? I tell you what, you get filled with yourself and it'll drive everybody nuts. All right, so you see Exodus. All right, you ready? Go with me to John chapter 18, please. Jesus in the garden will finish up with this. Now remember, he enters in Palm Sunday. He goes through, read it. The best one to read, they're all good. But if you read Mark, Mark is interesting because in Matthew, it depicts Jesus as the king. In Mark, it depicts Jesus as a servant. Here, there's quicker. In Luke, it depicts Jesus as a man. Luke, the, you know, physician. And in John, it depicts Jesus as the soon powerful king. You have that. It's called the four square. The four square gospel. Of course, you can run your memory on some of that. So, John 18, look at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out to, with his disciples, over the brook of Kidron, where he was, there was a garden. Now see, between the Olivets, the Mount of Olives, looking over to Jerusalem, there's a valley called Kidron. And in that valley, there's a little teeny garden there. And that's where Jesus' disciples used to meet. Kind of secretly outside of the eyes of the Romans and everything. Not that they were sneaking around. It just could do their business and talk openly. See? And this is where he's going to be betrayed. Also, the garden is called Gethsemane. But we usually think Gethsemane is the cross. But we don't think there was a little garden leading up to it. If you get a chance, take a look at Jerusalem. I was there. And I got to see some of these things. But look at a, at a picture of it. Get to see the, some of the streets. It's fun. You can even Google it and take it to work. Yeah, it's fun. 
walk where Jesus walked, you know. But he goes on and he says, that, and Judas who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Jesus having received detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns and torches and weapons and, and Jesus therefore knowing all things that would come to pass or come upon him went forward and said to them whom are you seeking? I love this. Now can you imagine the Sanhedrin which is 24 elders totally religious hated Jesus because Jesus came in and showed that they were so badly hypocrites and he didn't do it on purpose he just showed them that they were well off and they filled. They hated him. So they wanted to find somebody with Jesus' group that would betray him. Judas! So Judas, 30 pieces, he meets with them, and you know all the story. And then he gets all there. So Judas says, I'm going to kiss the one that you need to get. See, they didn't even know who Jesus really was, see. I'm going to kiss him, that's going to be him. And so they got the soldiers. And they, now these Roman soldiers, they were loaded for bear, spear, shield, big, you know, all that. They were the elite troops, you know. And if they come marching up there, and they're going to get Jesus. <laughs> Tough guy. And he goes, knowing their thoughts, who do you seek? We seek Jesus. Now, what did Jesus tell Moses to tell Pharaoh? that said to let my people go, what did he say his name was? God's always called his name one thing, I am. Not I was, not I will be. Before Abraham was, I am. He's the creator of all things. The Father thinks it, Jesus speaks it, and the Holy Spirit brings it to pass. That's how it works. So he's involved creating all things. And he says, I am. Well, if you read the account, they all went backwards and fell to the ground. They got slayed in the spirit. Old Pentecostal meeting going on here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he went back to the ground to show that they couldn't do anything with Jesus unless Jesus turned himself over as a lamb sacrifice. And your Savior turned himself over to these thieves and murderers so that you, says, could be saved. So that you, brother, could have the peace of God. He did all the... How could you want to say no to somebody that was willing to do all that? And then rises from the dead and says, I'm going to work with you the whole time. Now, it's, that's why the scripture says only a fool would say there's no God. Only a fool would say something like that. Because they're just kidding themselves. That's what a fool is. A fool is a person that's tricked themselves into believing something that is not. Say, I ain't no fool. Oh, you don't have to say that. Now, catch this, okay? And so they said to him, Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am he. And, and Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now, when they had said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? I think they were a little bit more humble now. Uh, Jesus? <laughs> Laying all over the ground. I mean, you got all that tons of armor on and you get knocked down and you don't know why. I think you'd be a little more reverent to the guy you're trying to take. And then he turns himself over. And that's why Peter got so mad. That's why the disciples ran and said, everybody turned their back on Jesus that day. All would be ashamed of me that day, he said. Now this is the 14th of April. He has Passover. He washes feet. They sing his song. They get up. It's about 1130 at night. They go down. He sings another song, prays for his disciples, and they head to the garden. The whole time knowing it's going to be a circus of these bozos coming to get me. <laughs> no, I don't think he thought that way, but I can just imagine. Who do they think they are? Don't they know I could call 10,000 of my angels, wipe them out? 
but he went as a lamb. Why? For you. For you. He went and he suffered more than you can imagine. We're going to read one more scripture and that's it. And it's in Isaiah 53. We know parts of it, but there's another part in there that we need to know. Are you with me? Isaiah. 53 verse 3, look what it says. He was despised and rejected by men. Can you see that? A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Remember Genesis chapter 5? That one name meaning sorrowful? Are you with me? And we hid as it were our, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. We didn't lift him up. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Remember we sweat great drops of blood. Yet we esteem him stricken and smitten by God. God's doing this to Jesus and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or punishment for our peace was put upon him. And by his bruises or stripes, we are healed. Not one day. God's got healing for you, sister. He's got healing for you, brother. You've got to reach up in faith and take it. When I say there's a word of knowledge, somebody has a healing, run forward and take it. If somebody's handing you $100 and you know you deserve it, take it. <laughs> Don't go false humility. Oh, I'm unworthy. First of all, the person already thought about it. They want to give you that $100. So don't make a whole circus out of it. Just say, Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, I'll take it in Jesus' name. Bless you. You see? So God gave his son. Will you take him in Jesus' name? Will you take him every day? Would you be like... This is my flesh and this is my blood. Would you partake of him every day? Yes. Why? Because every bite you partake of, you become healthier. You come, become wiser. You become full of hope and can see clearly past the clouds and the confusion that Satan tries to lay out. So watch this now. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. God the Father just laid all our sin on him. Woo! Man. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from the prison and from the judgment. Who will declare his generation? Say, I will. For he was cut from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked. But... With the rich at his death, because he has done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, yet it pleased the Father to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In other words, he's seeing Jesus suffer, knowing he's going to gain an entire family from that. You and I. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Jesus is called a perpetuation. Everyone say perpetuation. And don't Try not to spit on your neighbor. You know, perpetuation. That means that God was pleased in the means that Jesus did to save us. So the father actually is looking for you to honor and lift his son up. 
You get up in the morning, you even put your feet on the ground. You look like 100 pounds of sleep laying there on the pillow. And you open your mouth and say, Father, I love your son, Jesus Christ, my Lord. Your day is about to change. Oh, but we forget. How long are you going to not do it? You know, you just be encouraged to start asking God to get involved. God is a gentleman. How many's ever really met a true gentleman? Opens your door for you, sees to your knee, makes sure you pulls out your chair. A real, you could just like a butler type gentleman. God is a real gentleman. He'll wait till you ask him. You don't ask him, he'll continue to wait. God help me with this. Great. There he becomes your friend. Yet it pleased the Lord to lay on him all of our iniquities. Amen. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Aren't you glad? All started with the birth of Christ. All started. Palm Sunday, Jesus is now focused in what he's about to do in his last final hours. He was taken the 10th, Palm Sunday. He was crucified the 14th. You go back to um, Exodus, and it says to kill the lamb at twilight on the 14th. Now, how many days did he lay in the grave? Three days. And on the 17th, he rose. Up from the ground he rose. Amen. Mighty power over his foes. I don't know how exactly how it goes. Amen. So, but he rose and he led captivity captive. Now, you go back seven days from the 17th and it's the what? Tenth. And the lamb is chosen. So now you know the intricately, the mathematically perfect God who wants to be a part of your life. And my appeal to you now is, if you want more of him, would you stand to your feet? That should be everyone, because I don't think you've got enough. We're going to pray over you. Receive it. How many know you that you're not worthy to receive any prayers? But God's going to give them to you anyway. So get your mind off of you. Get your mind off of everybody else. And just take a minute. Talk with God and say, Lord, I want to open my heart to you. I'm going to take a big step here, and I'm going to ask you to really help me in everything. You're going to notice God promised me a change from today on. God's going to be more involved with you in a good way. Are you willing to let that happen? Amen. Does everyone say amen? Because he won't do it if you won't let him. He can't. So I want you to say with me, dear Heavenly Father, I want everything you have for me. I want to stop trying to figure things out. I need to trust you. I need you to work with me and to work out all of my problems. Sometimes before I even notice them. Help me not make the bad choices of life. And Lord, fill my heart now with hope, with freedom, with peace because I know you love me and I am accepted I'm accepted thank you Lord I belong to you so protect me Lord in Jesus name now look up and look around some of you can actually sense something different and that's good that's what happens in the spirit now how many here vacuum how many here notice that in a vacuum there's what on a vacuum well, come on, let's be honest. You got a bag in there. And the vacuum sucks up crud into the bag. So you are bags. No, listen, just I want to practice. 
practically tell you that you're go, you go through your day and you're sucking up information. Good, bad, there's this, there's that. Your memories, sorrow and all that. So to avoid your bag being over full so you don't work properly anymore, you meet with God just for 10, 15 minutes, talk with them, to, you know, just ask God to refresh in you, and you dump the bag. How do I dump the bag? Listen, God, everything that I might have done, my thoughts, anything that are negative and it will slow me down with you, I bundle up right now in the name of Jesus and I dump it in Jesus' name. I cast the care of it. And you have to say it. You can't think it. You can't think praise songs. You have to say them in order for it to create change. The only one God winks at is the people that are dumb can't speak. He goes on their heart, you see. But he goes on our lips and how we speak. So say, thank you, Jesus. Now look at about three people and say, I'm glad you're here today. All right, God bless you, watch over you, keep you, fill you with all kinds. There's somebody here that had a bunion on your big toe, on your right foot. You're going to find in three days it's going to be gone. God just healed it. All right, have a great day.